My name's Kurt Vest. I'm the enforcement engineer for the state. I've been the enforcement engineer for the past almost three years. Prior to that, I was the regional engineer down in, in Cedar City. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today are five different subjects, and they're not related. <laughs> so we'll be just jumping from one subject to the other, but uh, it's just kind of covering uh, a bunch of subjects that uh, aren't covered in other presentations. Okay, well, let's begin with enforcement. Um, a lot of has changed in enforcement over the past, uh, well, since 2005. Prior to 2005, this is how we handled enforcement. <laughs> Basically, we had no enforcement program. And uh, it became very difficult if somebody was violating a water right prior to 2005. The state engineer had no enforcement authority, and the only way we could deal with that violator was to take him to court. And that is a long and tedious process. I am aware in two cases in the Milford Valley we did do that. Um, one case, the guy was irrigating 80 acres with a five acre water right. And the other case, the guy was irrigating 40 acres with a domestic water right. So th those were very clear-cut cases that it was a, pretty much a slam dunk that we'd win. Um, however, it, it was very difficult to apply an, a, a, an enforcement program statewide when you had to take everybody to court that you had to, every violator to court. Uh, 2005 things changed. Now a lot of people think this is me. It's not. I do not have a gun and a badge. And the, the interesting thing is, is this is uh, from back in Maryland where I thought they had plenty of water, but they actually have a water cop back there. Um, in 2005, the statute was changed giving the state engineer enforcement powers. Uh, Along with that, in 2005, Administrative Rule R-655-14 was established, which uh, set forth the administrative, administrative procedures for en enforcement proceedings. So things changed in 2005. Um, the, the enforcement powers are set forth in section 73-2-25 of, of the Utah Code. Uh, in this section, it states that an, the state engineer can initiate an enforcement action when uh, somebody is taking water without a water right or is violating an existing water right. It states that uh, the state engineer can initiate an enforcement action when somebody fails to comply with the statute or orders regarding measuring devices and head gates. Uh, we can initiate an enforcement action if somebody fails to comply with an order or notice regarding dam safety or uh, stream alterations. What it does not grant the state engineer um, the state engineer cannot look at a violation that occurred more than one year in the past. So we can only deal with something that happened in that current year. Uh, the state engineer cannot resolve civil disputes among water users. Uh, the state engineer cannot uh, resolve internal disputes within an irrigation company or water company. And the state engineer cannot resolve right away easement or trespass disputes. And you'd be amazed how many times uh, I'm asked to address one of those issues. But uh, we have no authority there. So that, that's something they need to work out on their own. Okay, to commence an enforcement action, we, we, we have a referral process where if somebody witnesses a violation, they can submit a referral to us. Um, I work solely off those referrals. 
And just because somebody submits a referral, that does not initiate an enforcement action. That just makes me aware that there may be a problem. Uh, to initiate an enforcement action, we have to issue what's called an initial order. Within that order, we have to describe the violation that is taking place. We have to uh, um, advise them of potential penalties they face by committing the violation. And we notify them that each day's offense is a separate violation. If we do initiate an, uh, an enforcement action, uh, through that final order that is issued, the violator may be uh, assessed a fine, which cannot exceed $5,000 a day for each knowing violation or $1,000 a day for each unknowing violation. The violator may be forced to replace up to 200% of the water that was taken, and they may also be liable for the expenses that the division incurred in investigating and stopping the violation. Uh, keep in mind that each day that the violation continues as a separate offense, so you can see that the fines can get pretty heavy if, if they're unwilling to stop. Before imposing a fine, the law states that we need to take some things into consideration. We have to consider the value or qu quantity of water that was un unlawfully taken. Uh, we need to consider the gravity of the violation, including economic injury or impact to others. Uh, we consider whether or not the violator uh, complied with state engineer's orders and whether they were cooperative with us through that process. And we also take into consideration the economic benefit that was gained through the violation. Yes, question. <laughs> you can just repeat it. Um, you say penalty may not be imposed occurring 12 months before notice of violation. Is that the initial order, the final order that starts that clock? Uh, that 12 months goes back from the time the initial order was, was submitted. So, so when, when we begin the enforcement proce process, we can go back 12 months from that date. So the initial order is what's considered the notice of violation? What was that? The initial order is what's considered the notice of violation. Yes, yes, yes. Um, the, the, the thing that begins the enforcement process is the initial order or notice of violation. Well, um, <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> um, when, when I do get a referral and I investigate, I send out a notice of investigation, not a notice of violation, a notice of investigation. And through that process, if we feel we have to go through enforcement, then I issue that notice of violation, which is the initial order. Okay. Hopefully I cleared that up. Any other questions? Okay. Um, the the the, the uh, enforcement program, like I say, the law was changed in 2005. Um, the first enforcement engineer was a guy by the name of Kerry Carpenter, and at that time we we initiate, initiated a lot of enforcement actions. Uh, over a 10-year period, he initiated 50 enforcement actions, and we find a lot of people. Um, of course, the first thing that happens once somebody gets their fine is they go complain to their legislator. <laughs> and uh, we were starting to get a little bit of backlash because of the fines we were, we were assessing. So when I took over, we kind of changed our approach there. The law didn't change. We still have the authority to fine. We still have the authority to uh, uh, as 
assess those penalties. But the approach we take are taking now is any first time offense, we try and resolve the the case informally without having to initiate an, a formal enforcement process. Um, I'm still receiving just as many referrals as Carrie did, but I've only initiated one enforcement uh, action in, in the three years that, that I've been the enforcement engineer, and that was a re repeat offender. And, and that's kind of the approach we're taking is on repeat offenders, yeah, we will go through the enforcement process and they will be fined, but we will try to, to uh, resolve first time offenses informally, the goal being get them in compliance, whether it be terminating the violation or finding a water right to cover the violation, whatever they need to do. And I work with them to, uh, to uh, resolve the violation. And uh, that, you know, that being said, if the violation is severe enough that we feel enforcement is justified, we can, we can still do that on a first time offense. We just kind of look at that at a case by case basis. But uh, that, that's the approach we're taking now. It's kind of a softer approach. We still have the authority. So, so nothing has changed with the law. It's just the approach we take to, uh, to uh, implementing that law and, and resolving the violations. Any, any questions on that before we move on? Okay. So, even though we're taking a softer approach, remember the law is still in place. That doesn't give you an excuse to go out and commit a violation thinking, oh, they're, they're not going to hit me the first time. Remember, I still carry a big stick. <laughs> I still have that authority that I can find you. So, uh, I guess what I'm saying is don't take what I'm saying here today as an excuse to go out and violate a water right because <laughs> there still may be consequences there. Okay. Before, any more questions on enforcement before we go to the next subject? Okay. Let's move on to dam safety. Uh, this image brings back bad memories for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is South Creek Dam, which is a tributary to the Virgin River. Back in 2010, I was the regional engineer in that area, and we had a significant rainfall event, and we got a, uh, a call saying that uh, a dam, uh, the, their words were, it was, a, was an imminent failure. So me and Nathan Moses hopped on a helicopter and they flew us into the site. This is actually a photo taken from the helicopter of that dam. And you, you can see there's, there's some things happening there. Things are sliding off. And we, we went and landed on the, the, to the side of the dam and began our investigation. And we, we determined that the, the core of the dam w was stable. Everything was in place. What was happening was the overburden was becoming saturated and beginning to slide off, but the core itself was still, still safe. Um, we got back in the helicopter, thought they were going to take us back to our vehicle. No, they took us to the uh, county administration building and they said they wouldn't take us back to the vehicle unless I held a press conference. <laughs> so they kind of held me ho hostage. <laughs> and basically reported our findings. And that night I kept dreaming about that dam failing and people downstream being killed because I, I said it was okay. <laughs> little did I know the next day when I woke up, the dam was still there, but, but little did I know they, they'd actually, the, the town of Virgin, they evacuated and provided motel rooms there for them in St. George, so there was nothing to worry about anyway. But, uh, uh, Th this is a case of what we deal with, though, it, with, with dam safety. Um, it's been my experience through 20 years of, it in, of inspecting dams is that most of the large dams are in good shape and in good repair. They're well-maintained. 
and most of your small dams are in disrepair and poorly maintained. <laughs> and, and I guess it, it just goes to, you know, if the dam's big enough, you know, it, it, there's resources there to, to maintain it, but typically on your small little irrigation ponds, uh, the farmers and so forth typically don't have that money to, to maintain and, and keep them uh, up to standards. The state engineer does have power to regulate dams. Um, the state engineer makes rules control, controlling uh, construction and operation of dams. Uh, these rules include design, maintenance, repair, removal, and abandonment of the dam. Uh, the state engineer may exempt any dam that uh, that is less than 20 acre feet and if it were to fail would not cause loss of human life. And he can also exempt any other larger dam that if it were to fail would not cause human life and only minor property damage. Okay, so we do have a uh, inspection program most of your high hazard well all of your high hazard all of your moderate hazard dams are inspected throughout the state on a routine basis and even some of your, your low hazard dams are inspected de depending on where they are um, if somebody is building a dam uh, the person that uh, is in charge of uh, Preparing the design for that dam uh, must be licensed in the state of Utah and they must be experienced in dam design and construction. Written approval must be obtained from the state engineer prior to commencing work on any dam. Now, this is whether or not you need to uh, submit formal, pl formal plans or not. You know, I mentioned before there's some that have exemptions to submitting formal plans. Even those that do not have to have formal plans submitted, you still have to submit what's called a small dam application and still get approval through the state engineer. So the state engineer's office still has to evaluate the hazard rating on any dam you're going to build. And so no matter what, if you're going to build a dam, you got to get approval through the state engineer's office. If it's large enough and have, has a high enough hazard, you will have to submit formal plans. If it's exempted from that, you still have to submit a, what's called a small dam application that we review the hazard rating on. So keep that in mind. Anytime you build a dam, you have to submit an application with the state engineer. Okay. Yes, question. What if you purchase property where there's already a dam existing, but you didn't build it, and they didn't they didn't get this approval process done? Um, <laughs> that there there are lots of dams that fall into that category that were created prior to uh, well w without the authority. A lot, a lot of them were were done in the past, probably when before the, the these laws were enacted that requires this, I, I guess you would have to look at when was it created. If it was created recently, you probably need to, uh, first of all, make sure there's a water right to cover that dam. And second of all, you, you might want to contact the division and find out, hey, do we have an issue here or not? If it's a small dam, probably you, you won't even have to worry about it as long as there's a water right covering that. I guess what I'm saying is just because the prior owner did it doesn't excuse you from fulfilling requirements there. Um, if it if it was created several years ago, you're, you're probably okay. I don't know. Did, did that, does that sound reasonable? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. What elevation of Hang on. Anytime there's a raised embankment, we need to look at it. Well, like a two foot, uh, I put a, a canvas dam in a ditch. You don't. Well. <laughs> at what point do you say, 
uh, a berm? When does a berm become a dam? Well, um, uh, obviously canals and, and ditches, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not looking at that. Right. Um, anytime though there is a raised embankment that, that holds back a significant amount of water, yeah, we, we need to look at it. Um, a while ago you said 20 acre, didn't you? Well, that, that's exempt from filing formal plans, but you still have to submit what's called a small dam application where we look at it and make sure you have water rights covering that and, and evaluate a hazard rating on that. But uh, that, it, that just exempts you from the formal plans, but it does not exempt you from, from what filling. I, what I'm thinking of in some of the developments today, I see water, landscape, pond, features. Uh, yeah, I have. If they have a raised embankment, and, and hold a significant amount of water, they, they probably need to be looked at. First of all, you need a water right to do it. Right. A dugout hole is not a raised embankment. No, but even a dugout hole may need a water right if you're, if you're storing a significant amount of water. It's not water in your parking lot you get from your neighbor. Yeah. Um, so so if, if it's dug out, yeah, you don't have to submit a dam, at, a dam application but you, you still have to have a water right to cover that impoundment of water. So. That is, that's significant because a lot of parking lots are building now a pond to contain water that runs off that parking lot so it doesn't bother the neighbor. Is that considered an impoundment that needs a water right? You're just trying to deal mo with runoff. Mo most of the runoff facilities, ha they are temporary storage where the water runs in in, in high advance and then it runs on through. Um, I, you know, if, if they're impounding water, yeah, you know, if, if they're storing water all the time, yeah, they need, they need water, right? Flood control, uh, that, that's a different animal. That, that, uh, like I say, most, most of those, uh, um, you're, you're okay with. Any other questions? Okay, inspection of dams. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Through the inspection program, the state engineer may issue orders for engineering studies, repairs, storage, he may uh, issue storage limitations, he may require the dam be removed or breached, and uh, any other remedy that the state engineer deems appropriate. The owner of the dam is responsible for maintain, maintaining that dam and uh, making any repairs or uh, keeping the dam up to, up to standards, okay? Um, and, and that's one thing I noticed a lot when I was inspecting dams, you, 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 find issues with the dam, you, you'd say, hey, you got issues here, and, and if it's a small dam, very often it was just ignored. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm aware of a couple cases where they ignored those recommendations, the dam failed and, and caused significant damage. And uh, so you, you, you might want to pay attention to those inspection reports and do any necessary maintenance, or you might find yourself liable for some uh, damages. Okay, any more questions on, on dam safety? Okay, now let's talk about stream alterations. Um, in order to divert water from a stream, you need a water right. And anytime you alter the stream, whether it's the bed or the banks of the stream, you need a stream alteration permit. And these stream alteration permits are uh, approved under the Clean Water Act, Section 404. The state engineer has authority to, to issue these state permits. Um, well, I, I always like this photo that's, that's part of this, this slide there's something pretty illegal as part of that photo. 
Does anybody recognize what, what's happened there? What, what, I say somebody, somebody see? Yeah, the, look at that Detroit riprap. <laughs> Detroit riprap's not an approved riprap. <laughs> it's funny because when, when, when we had all the flooding in the, in the early 1980s, a lot of Detroit riprap was put into be beds and banks of, of streams to, to shore them up. I, I can assure you that we, we don't approve that. <laughs> but, but you find it all the time on these streams. Um, so anytime you alter the bed or banks of the stream, you need a stream alteration permit. Uh, that is ob obtained through our office. There is a fee associated with that permit. Uh, that fee depends on who you are. <laughs> and we didn't set that fee. That fee was set by the legislator. If you're a non-commercial applicant, the fee is $100. If you're a governmental applicant, the fee's $500. I guess that's one case where we kind of took it to the government, huh? <laughs> and if you're a commercial applicant, the fee is $2,000. That, that's just the fees that were set. So depending on where you, you fall into that, that, that's what you would pay for that stream alteration application. Who's a non-commercial? What's an example of a non-commercial applicant? A farmer who needs to protect his stream, it's starting to eat away at his land. Can throw a car in there? It, it, <laughs> yeah, he wants to throw a car. We say, no, you got to do it this way. But, but what if he's really producing a lot of, I mean, he's got a commercial operation. I, I think by commercial, I think you, you were talking more like these, these big companies that put pipelines throughout the state. They have to fill out these uh, stream alterations as they go. Um, I, you know, I, I think non-commercial is just private landowners. Um, but but if, if you have construction companies or, or power companies or, you know, that they're, these are the entities that fall under that, the uh, commercial designation. I don't see the Army, Army Corps of Engineers listed. They are the ones that, the Army Corps of Engineers are the ones that granted the state the authority. That's where that comes, okay. Yeah. And, and these, stream or these stream alteration applications, um, they have a chance to review if, if we feel, I, I don't know exactly how the stream alteration specialists determine that, but, but they have an opportunity to. It, to review and comment. It actually happens the other way. We yeah. send everyone to them. We send everyone to them and they and say they which tell ones. tell us which ones they will allow a joint permit. Okay. So, so th they are involved in that, yes. Any other questions on stream alterations? Okay, let's move on to the next. Groundwater recharge and recovery. This is one of those things that is kind of a new thing going on here. Uh, this slide is an aerial image of Sand Hollow Reservoir down in Washington County. Uh, I was involved in the applications on th this, this uh, reservoir. Uh, this reservoir is built over a sandstone formation and they knew that when they built it, they were gonna lose a lot of water. And uh, Ron Thompson, the, the head of the district down there being forward thinking like he is, figured out that, hey, we, we can make this work for our benefit. So they filed a recharge and a recovery application. And all those red dots you see around the reservoir are, are wells where they can recover the water that seeps into that formation. They measure the water going into the reservoir. They measure the water going out. They measure the evaporation that's occurring over the reservoir. And with that data, they can calculate how much water is going into the ground and uh, they have approval to pump that water out and use it 
in their municipal supplies. Um, this is the typical recharge recovery project. Now we have a lot of them that are not typical. One thing I want to make clear, you can file a recharge application without having to file a recovery application. And we're seeing a lot of these uh, recently, especially in areas where you have groundwater de decline, where they're mining aquifers. Um, down, down where I'm located in Iron County, Beaver County, th there are several of these type of uh, projects where they're just recharging the aquifer. During the winter when excess water is flowing by, for instance, the Central Iron County Water Conservancy District, they have a recharge application that allows them to take water from Coal Creek and dump it into gravel pits during the winter when the farmers aren't using it. And these gravel pits recharge the aquifer. Uh, one of the other things they do at the end of the irrigation line They've extended the, the pipeline out and they're actually during the winter dumping it into an old spring area where springs used to flow. And because of the pumping, those springs have dried up. They're now using that spring area as a recharge area. Parowan City, same thing. They're, they're dumping water into a gravel pit. Uh, Beaver County, the Milford Valley pumpers, if the Beaver River flows past the Minersville Dam during the winter, they will divert that water out to Hay Spring area where they recharge. So, so we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot of these type of projects. And so keep in mind, you can file a recharge, and, and, and if they would have filed a recovery application in these cases, we probably wouldn't have granted that because these are, these are aquifers that are being mined Groundwater is declining. Uh, we wouldn't approve any. The, the, if we would approve that, that would have been a new appropriation in a fully appropriated basin. So keep in mind, you can file a recharge application and a recovery application. Uh, well, you, you don't have to file a recovery application to file a recharge. You can file a recharge. Uh, if you have a project like Washington County where you want to use the water that's going in there, yeah, you can file a recovery. So, so let's talk a little bit about these applications. Um, okay, a person proposing to recharge the aquifer. First of all, it must have a valid water right. Um, or you have an agreement with a person who owns a valid water right. And uh, And through that process, if you file a recovery permit, you can only recover what water you, you can show is still available to be recovered. Uh, to file a recharge permit, uh, this is what needs to be on, on that application. You need to identify the groundwater basin that you're gonna recharge. You must have a legal description uh, of the proposed recharge project. You must have the source of water that you're going to recharge. You must have a water right for that water. You must have, uh, you must determine the water quality of the water being recharged, as well as the water quality of the aquifer that's receiving that. And you must have filed for all the appropriate water quality permits. And, uh, you must develop a plan of operation. This plan of operation includes design capacity. It details a monitoring program and it de outlines the purpose and duration of the project. You must have a study which demonstrates the, uh, the area that will be impacted through the project uh, you must show that it, the project is, is, econo er, is hydrologically feasible. And you must show that the project will not 
uh, unreasonably harm land or impair existing water rights. The uh, study must also show the amount of water that can be recovered. And you must show that you have the financial capability to uh, proceed with, with the project. The fi a filing fee is assessed for the recharge application. That filing fee is based on the amount of water you intend to recharge. And it typically is the same fee that uh, we assess any change application or other application dealing with water. Okay, the recovery permit. If you want to recover the water that you've put into that aquifer for use, this is a separate application you must file. Um, this application must describe the legal description of the wells where you intend to recover the water, uh, the name of the source, the purpose for which you want to recover the water, the depth and diameter of the wells, and a legal description of the land where you intend to use the water, as well as you must have design pumping capacity of the wells. The filing fee for this is a set fee, and it is $2,500. So if you want to recover water, it's a pretty significant fee. Can I jump in here? Yeah. In case you've zoned out, there's a test question that includes a number on this page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> recharge permits free then? No, no, recharge still has a fee, but that fee is based on the amount of water that you're going to recharge. So if, if you file a change application for the first, uh, geez, it's been so long since I've done a change application. Let's <laughs> see, the fee for instance, yeah, $150 for, for uh, the first 75 acre feet. Yeah, it, it, and then it goes up depending on how many acre feet. It's the same fee schedule that we use for change applications. Okay. Part of the uh, project is you must have a monitoring program. The state engineer, when you file this application, will establish a storage account for each recharge and recovery project. Uh, the person who holds the permit must monitor the operation of the project and its impacts, and he must file a report with the state engineer, which uh, states, outlines the quantity of water that was stored and recovered and the, the water quality of the recharged water, receiving aquifer, and the recovering water. So you gotta monitor water quality there. There is an annual fee assessed for this uh, monitoring program, and that fee just covers the cost of the division to uh, maintain that, that storage account. I, I don't, it's, it's, it's a minimal fee, I, I would assume, so, yeah. So keep in mind, you, you, you can't just say you're gonna put water in the ground or pull water out, you have to monitor and you have to make sure what your, the impacts to the system are. Oh, okay, any, any other questions on recharge recovery? Okay, well, let's move on to the last section. <laughs> Reuse of water or wastewater. <laughs> I don't think this is what we mean, <laughs> but, I, but I found this photo and I thought it was, you know, kind of hilarious. <laughs> Although I think they can treat wastewater to the point that you can do this, but I'm glad I don't live in an area where they do that. <laughs> okay. Any public agency who owns a publicly owned treatment works that treats domestic water uh, that consists of a 
water right, a municipal water right, can uh, file an application to reuse water. Um, the, they must have a water right that's administered by the state engineer as a municipal water right. So, so these ha they we're just talking about municipal water here, okay? Uh, the reuse of water has to be consistent with the underlying water right and the public entity must receive approval from the Water Quality Board as well as the state engineer. Okay. Um, if the public entity does not own the water, they can enter a contract with somebody who does. Uh, the person they contract with, that, that water has to, be, has to be changed to municipal water and it has to be under the control of, of that municipality. Um, the same principle applies to the, the, any water right that is, is used under contract with a private entity. Uh, the, it's under the control of the municipality and the same water right requirements apply to these water rights as well. It must be approved by the Water Quality Board and the state engineer and the reuse must be consistent with the underlying water right. Okay, the application to the state engineer. It shall include a description of the underlying water right, an evaluation of the under, underlying water rights diversion, depletion, and return flow requirements. It must include an estimate of the quantity of water that will be reused, and you must have an evaluation of the depletion from the hydrologic system. The important thing here is they can't deplete any more than what was historically depleted under the, the underlying water right. And so, so if the city were to go out and purchase, say, a irrigation right, that was about, had a depletion of about 60%, they file a change, bring it into their system, uh, they are still limited to that 60% depletion. And, and through using the water and reuse, they can't deplete any more than that historic 60% or whatever their water rights, their depletion of their water rights add up to. We've got a clarification question. Reuse water right to recharge or irrigation? Can it be done at all? Reuse water to... Wa reuse water right to recharge or irrigation? T typically, it's for irrigation. Yeah, that, that's where I've seen it is, is they'll treat the water to quality that they can then pump it out on a field and irrigate with. Uh, is there any other type of reuse that's taking place? Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's really the only thing that's going on right now is, is reusing it for irrigation. Yeah. About fracking? Fracking? I don't know what that has to do with reuse, but what? Yeah, in the oil fields and stuff, but uh, th that really doesn't apply to 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 reuse of water. Uh, you know, may may apply in it, in recharge or recovery, but it, yeah, it well, it does in a special sense when they're developing oil wells, then they produce water and some of that water is being used in the development of other wells. And we're not permitting that. If they're putting the water back where they took it, no harm, no yeah. foul. Keep in mind, we're only talking about public water supplies that are going through a public treatment facility and then permitting to reuse that water. That's all we're talking about here. It must be a public entity, must have a, a treatment facility that's treating it to a usable standard and then applying to reuse. He's wondering, uh, he, said he, he said reuse, has, but he said reuse has to be consistent with the underlying right. Ba basically what we're talking about there is depletion. I, if historically the underlying right was irrigation, 60% depleted, you, you transfer it to a municipality, which then goes through your, your 
you know, it's used by your residents, goes through your wastewater treatment facility, and then they want to reuse that coming out the other end. They can't, the, the overall depletion can't exceed the historic use that was for irrigation. So that, that's all we're talking about there is it, that, that the diversion and depletion must be consistent with the underlying water right. Okay. You, you can't deplete more than what historically was. So if you've already depleted it by the time um, you get to the treatment facility, you know, you're full right, you know, you probably can't work out one of these projects. Uh, most cases, most municipalities, um, you know, the water that goes through your, your, your in-home uses is typically about 20% depletive. So about 80% of the water makes it out of the treatment facility. So if the historically the water was 60% depletive, what your end result is, is 20% uh, is being depleted before it gets there. So you can see there's, there's, there's room to reuse some of that water and stay within your depletion. Okay. Um, Okay, this, this last statement, the state engineer shall conclude that reuse is consistent with the underlying water right if the use does not enlarge the underlying water right and any return flow requirements of the underlying water right is satisfied. So if it meets those two conditions, then we can move forward with, with that project. A any other questions on reuse? It's my understanding that if it's That that is if they established. Oh, the, the the question was his understanding was if it's a municipal water right, the depletion is 100 percent. That's true if the water right was originally established as a municipal water right, but if a city goes out and purchases a irrigation water right, then it's not 100 percent depletive. They're they're re, they're limited to whatever the historic depletion was of the water right they purchase. So can you? Change application or whatever. Thank you. Convert that to a municipal water right. Yeah, yeah. City, all that. Cities do that all. That's where cities okay. get their water for growth. They go out and buy irrigation right. rights or, or, or mining rights, whatever. When they go through a change application process, we evaluate the historic diversion and depletion of those rights. And th those diversion and depletions are spelled out in the approval for the municipality. So, that's the numbers that they work with when they do a reuse project. They have to make sure they don't exceed those historic diversion and depletions. Okay, so they don't, once you've changed that traditional water right to a municipal water right, that depletion does not go away, does not become 100% depletion? No, it doesn't become 100%. You're, okay. you're, you, you inherit whatever that underlying water right is you purchased. Okay. And you're, you have to deal with those. So, here, here's a word of advice. If you're a municipality going out and looking for water, go find a bunch of stock water, because it's 100% depleted. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's not a large group of, they, they usually have to deal with irrigation rights when they make those, those purchases and changes. Okay, any, any other questions on uh, reuse? Okay. Well, that, that kind of wraps up what, uh, what I've been assigned to. Why, why is this important, though? You know, water is our limiting resource, especially here in the West. Um, it, it is our limiting, it, it's what will determine how much we can grow, it will determine Water quality becomes an issue. Source of supply becomes an issue. You know, it, it's something that, uh, uh, you know, people have fought over. And people are going to continue to fight over. And, and yeah, you, you may say, oh, this sounds like a lot of regulation. But if we weren't here, where would we be? <laughs> if we weren't trying to get control of, of the allocation of this water, it, you know, we, we'd be looking at some pretty serious fights there. That's why we have 
what we're talking about here today. That, that's why we have the state engineer's office and, and that's why we're here is to try and minimize these fights over water. With that, are there any questions? Yeah. So on a reuse, if a municipality has, let's say, a, a irrigation water right, so it had 50% depletion historically, and they want to reuse it, what percentages do you guys use? So for example, if it was a 100 acre foot diversion, but 50 acre foot depletion in the historical right, and you're, you know, do you apply 20%? So then you have, 50 acre foot rights of depletion, and, and if I yeah. use it for domestic, that's 20%, so I have 80 acre feet left, and then I put it in my pressurized irrigation system, what depletion percentage would you apply to that? Would you apply? Now, now, and keep in mind, if it was, it was originally 100 acre feet of diversion of 50% 50 50 depletion, that means there's 50 acre feet that you can deplete. Through your typical municipal use, you, you deplete 20% of that, so there'd be 30% available for reuse you see how that right, now, now, now those that are just that. those are just hypothetical numbers right. okay it's up to the city to show us do, do you have we, we, percentages like so a lot of cities have pressurized irrigation so if i take that reuse and put in my pressurized irrigation what depletion am i in Tip, typically the irrigation the, the the depletion of that is the same as the historic irrigation 50 percent yeah so if I, but, but if it came so, through domestic, it's so, 20%. So the city has to take into account all its uses and determine, okay, what are, what are we diverting and what are we actually consuming and what's making right. it out to the, to the treatment facility, what do we have left that we can so, reuse? So in that analogy, because I have 50 acre foot depletion, if I run it through domestic, I've depleted 20 acre foot, I can only divert then 60 acre foot of the 80 because you're no 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 that. you can only divert 30 acre feet no if i'm doing 50 percent depletion so i have 30 acre feet left to deplete yeah so you I have 30 acre feet to deplete i can divert 60 acre foot because i'm going to deplete 60 of it and the other is going to go back to the system right because you're only cons pressurized irrigation you're saying is 50 percent depletion yeah well the, the 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 key element here is depletion okay that's really what we what we're concerned with uh, they're not going to divert more than they have a right to. Okay. Right. Typically, they might divert less because of the depletion factor. They may, they may have to consider. Um, but keep in mind, it's up to the cities to show us what they're using water for, what they're depleting, what's making it out there, and show us that they can do that without. But as a rule of thumb, you're looking at 50 percent for. PI system. And it changes from area to area. Right. Yeah. I, I have areas that are that are 60% uh, depleted. I have area, you know, when I was regional here, I had areas that were, the irrigation was 60% depleted. Others that were 50%, some were, it just, it, it varies from, you know, it, it really depends on, you know, the, the uh, the evapotranspiration in, in that particular area and what the duty of that water right is. So it changes. I, I know uh, uh, there's some areas of the state that only have a three acre foot duty and their percentage of depletion typically is a little higher than, than a, say a four acre foot duty is. You know, it really depends on uh, the area. but. But when we, when a change application is filed, moving water from irrigation to municipal, we evaluate the historic diversion depletion. That's spelled out. So that's the number the city then has to work with to stay within. And if they want to do a, re re or a reuse project, they have to show us that they're staying within those numbers. <laughs>